My name is James Farmer, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Recreation, Park, and Tourism Studies in the School of Public Health, and I'm honored to be here to moderate today. When they first um, invited me to participate in this, I, I, I agreed because it had to do with sustainability, and, and that's my passion, that's what I researched, but then I thought, I was like, well, I'm going to have to spend the next you know, couple of months researching migration, and, and fortunately I'm a moderator and not a panelist uh, <clears throat> giving a presentation. But I, I find this in incredibly intriguing, and this first panel on what causes people to move is an, a, an incredible, interesting, uh, timely, and serious topic. Um, and a topic that also should resonate with all of us. For if, I feel like if we look within our own ancestry, very not in the you know not too distant past, we'll see a relative's journey. Maybe it's somebody that, that arrived at Jamestown. It could be a, a relative that uh, arrived aboard a slave ship in Havana, or a relative that crossed the Hindu Kush, um, or somebody that moved out of the coal fields of Harlan County, Kentucky, to find uh, work in the industrial north. Humans have been migrating following bison herds, antelope herds, um, in response to religious persecution, seeking, um, uh, seeking asylum from, from, from strife. Um, and we humans have been migrating for countless, you know, basically forever, and we have many, many stories, many, many histories of migration. But today I feel is, is somewhat different. I don't know if that's because it's our migration story, it's what we're witnessing and living through the world, but I also think there's an element that distinguishes today's migration from others. And this it has to do with the global issues surrounding sustainability and natural resources and their usage, usage, which are being exhausted by humans and the overuse that ultimately affects global climate cycles and the change on our natural systems. Never before have the activities and functions of one or two continents had such dire implications across all other continents, across all other people. We're witnessing this aggregated behavior of the world's privileged minority um, and its effect on all species, including all people, but most prominently impacting the most marginalized, most silenced, most underseen, putting them most at risk. And accordingly, today we meet for this symposium on sustainable development, this human migration. We have uh, three distinguished guests to discuss these critical intricacies, as well as the broad consideration for how migration is coupled with sustainability. First, we have Dr. Waters from the IU Maurer School of Law. We'll present the migration crisis as a systems dilemma, a system of unequal and duly underperforming states, or at least underperforming from the ideal of what we see. Second, we have Dr. Trix, Emeritus Faculty in Anthropology and Near Eastern Languages and culture, Cultures Departments. We'll examine when and why refugees embark on permanent migrations, never to return to their homeland. And finally, Dr. Manwala from the International Human Rights Law Clinic at American University will discuss the relationships between gender and migration, posting the similarities and differences that women and men, boys and girls, face in the migration experience. So we'll begin with each panelist's seven-minute presentation, followed by questions from the audience and, and answers from the experts. And I'll attempt to ensure that everybody who has a question, uh, we can facilitate a great conversation uh, so everybody has an opportunity to talk. So I'll turn it over um, to our first panelist. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, so uh, Mr. Buckley has framed this quite rightly in terms of the, the, the broad patterns of migration. I, I titled my seven minutes. Uh, uh, the migration crisis as systems. I'm going to be focusing so on, on, on that piece of it that people tend to focus on, which is the part that looks like a crisis as opposed to uh, the, the broader patterns of uh, normal migration. But I do want to suggest that the crisis part is also uh, normal, it's systemic, uh, that's the thing I want to focus on. So if our subject is what causes people to move, I think it's, we might as well equally ask what prevents people from moving, because I think the answer is, is the same thing. Uh, from, from my perspective, uh, uh, this is uh, a function of the system of states and the, the structural inequality that that system both implies and entrenches. And I want to say, uh, given our recent discussions in this country, uh, inequality is not necessarily a bad thing, I'm just saying it's a thing, right? it's a description. And the nature of a state system uh, that produces diverse political territorial units, uh, you can expect inequality between them. And it's what's going to drive uh, both the movement of people and the obstacles to it. Um, the, the state system is a, is a means to achieve certain social and political ends. It, it's also a kind of uh, inertial outcome. It's a logical outgrowth of uh, a, a whole series of, shall we say, secular security dilemmas, uh, attempts to resolve uh, 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 questions of, of economic and social policy. It's a way of 
organizing the world that ensures that we do some things, um, uh, even though it also produces what we might call externalities, right? Side effects that we don't like, uh, like the so-called migration crisis. Um, but it's not a, necessarily a, a preference, uh, the system of states. Rather, given the, the sort of technological material conditions in which we live, it's, it's an inevitability. Right? It's really, uh, it is not the only way to organize human societies, but it's, it's uh, very impossible to imagine anything other than a state-like entity uh, governing most of the surface of the Earth today, given the conditions we have. Uh, as long as these conditions hold, we can expect that the system will be largely in place. So we can alter it at the margins, but not just as we please. It suggests that our response to the economic and uh, crisis migration patterns is going to be marginal as well. So we shouldn't be surprised at the flows of migrants seeking to escape one more or less closed political system into another to improve their own personal circumstances in, in sort of an act of transposition or a border crossing or a transgression, which are the kind that we in the academy are so uh, uh, metaphorically enchanted with. We like to talk about transgressions. But those borders, I mean the, the literal ones, the ones that actually police the space between two states, are not nearly as intangible as we like to imagine uh, in the academy. If you think about the, the contours of the European migration crisis, which of course isn't European, but that's where the migrants are ending up, so that's what we tend to refer to it as, um, I think they should put to rest any notion that, that states can't control their borders. They often don't, but they certainly can. If you think about the flows out of Turkey, right, these have been re dramatically reduced in the last year due to a, a, a deal between the European Union and Turkey, and if that flow increases again, it will be because Turkey uh, chooses to open the gates uh, uh, of the Aegean again as a policy choice. It might feel constrained to do it, but it'll be an act of state, uh, just as the shutting off of that flow, or the dramatic reduction of it, was an act of state. Um, many people bemoan the Hungarian border fence. I, I think, editorially, these are people who don't understand the actual nature of the European Union and Schengen as a political project, which is a border unit, and Hungary simply built the actual border that the unit implies. Um, but whether or not we approve of it, you have to note its efficacy, its effect on actually shutting or shunting migration patterns uh, elsewhere. Um, so, uh, and the most recent iteration uh, that I've paid some small attention to, yes, migrants continue to cross the Mediterranean and to die in the process in large numbers, but they don't just cross in any place, no longer so much in the Aegean. Um, they're flowing uh, the largest groups through, through Libya, and that's because Libya has largely ceased to exist as a functioning state. It's not, uh, it becomes a portal because it's one of the places where the normal functions of the state have ceased to work. Um, migrants aren't crossing uh, into Spain in similar numbers uh, through uh, Spanish enclaves on the northern coast. And if you, if you want to know why, just Google the words uh, Ceuta, Melilla, uh, and border fence, and you'll see pictures that explain why uh, migrants don't cross there. Um, at the same time, the, the ceaseless efforts of millions of people to cross these borders simply reaffirms the radical differences in the territories behind those lines, those borders, right? Uh, the, the, a daily reaffirmation that place matters, that our politics are not just local, they're territorial, um, and necessarily, I would argue, irreducibly so. People are physical beings, people move because place matters, and because place matters, our politics will always control the movement of people. Uh, Cynthia mentioned the, the, the need, perhaps arguably, to um, uh, adjust our rules. Uh, I'm a lawyer, uh, and I think that's an accurate description of the, of the social and political world, but one component of that is that the legal system uh, doesn't necessarily move just because it ought to. It's a sticky point, uh, and it actually creates a, uh, 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 well, let's we use the phrase in the academy, it gives states a site of resistance against the logic of economics and politics and social change. The legal system isn't going to move just because it ought to. Um, and it, it is quite uh, sticky and resistant. So, to close, I think I'm ending my time here. Okay, you go on. Oh, well, then I'll just go on, right? Uh, no, I'm going to close anyway. The point I want to make is that this migration crisis is a function of the system we have. And while this tide is likely to recede or redirect itself, it is unlikely to fundamentally change so long as the system of states has the quality it does. And that, I'm afraid, is a system that is even less likely to change. For all the, to my mind, frothy enthusiasm for global governance, 
as an analytical and normative framework, framework, states are functional and embedded, whether we like them or not, they are uh, eminently survivable units, and they will shape the causes and the obstacles to human movement uh, under the horizon. I must stand up because I can't talk to At least not to you. In my retirement, I'm very proud of my retirement. I retired so I could work at refugees, and it's fairly recent, so. Allow me to smile as I say this. Um, I've been writing books. And when you write books rather than articles, you speak differently. So I step back more. Have your way, friends. Yeah. <laughs> I have to move forward. Tim, Tim knows me. Um, so actually, this is because I'm writing another book. I just had one book come out in this. But um, when do people migrate for good? Okay, so this is different than what Cynthia's been talking about. So, refugees in and from Europe, and in my background, I've actually been uninterested in Europe. Uh, I'm interested in languages, and European languages have never interested me very much. I mean, we started with French, but then got to Turkish. And once you move out to some other languages, and then you think, oh, well. Anyhow, in my mature age, I've come back to Europe. And Europe is actually kind of fascinating. But when do people migrate for good refugees in and from, from Europe? And this Photograph, I, I want to contradict Cynthia. Um, forced migration of Muslims from Europe. There are a lot of women and children here, and frankly, the men are dead. And these people didn't sign up for anything, probably because they couldn't write. Um, okay? So, in many of migrations of refugees, it is old people, women, and children. Okay? So, allow me to contradict you. Um, so forced migrations, when there have been this kind of war, um, they are old people, women, and children. Um, and this happens a lot. So why do people migrate for good from where they've lived for generations? Realize this is not all these migrations. We're not talking step migration. We're not talking people going back. I'm, my real interest is in refugees. And what I've found, I've been working with refugees and immigrants my whole life. I'm a Detroiter, and I'll talk about that for a minute. But um, th this is something we need to understand. And I'm going to be looking in this seven minutes, huh? um, I'm going to be looking at two groups, the situation of mass migrations of refugees in Europe, and then a case study. As an anthropologist, this is what we try to do. We try to set a broader context, and then we try to look at something where we can look more closely. Is this clear? As I'm easily distracted, but I'm going to try to come down closer. Okay. And then my background is linguistic anthropology. So this is language and dialects are crucial to trace people where they come from and to build rapport. As a Detroiter, I've worked in immigrant communities my whole life with Arabs. These are the different groups in Detroit of Albanians, different dialects, different backgrounds, many of whom were refugees. Most people will not tell you they were ever refugees. Okay. They're Americans. Okay. That's, a, that's a big deal. Nobody ever wants to say that we're a refugee. I've also done research in Kosovo, Macedonia, Albania, these other countries, and I speak multiple languages. Okay, number one, the first area, mass migrations of refugees in Europe before the 19th century. I think it's really important to step back. The context that Cynthia was talking about is really important. And this is the book I'm working on now. On, I just came back from Germany. I spent the fall in Germany looking at how the Germans are dealing with the new refugees. And I decided I needed to understand more about Europe. I was never interested in Europe, and then I realized I was very ignorant uh, about Europe. So I looked at mass migrations of refugees in Europe before the 19th century. They tended to be religious minorities. And this was interesting to me. People know about the Jews expelled from Spain in 1492. Muslims expelled from Spain the next century on. And then the next group, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685. These were the 
French Protestants, the Huguenots, people know about that. That's interesting. This is the first time with the Huguenots they used the term refugee. Isn't that interesting? The first time that people really talked about refugees was with the French Protestants. Um, what's interesting about these groups is unlike, not all, but many current refugees, these three groups were welcomed in other places. So who welcomed the Jews from Spain? <coughs> the Ottomans. The Isaac II welcomed the Jews from Spain, said, come to the Ottoman Empire. Why was Salonika a great Jewish city? Because by Isaac II said, come to our Ottoman cities. He said, Ferdinand and Isabella, you're fools. These are good citizens. The Muslims from Spain were welcomed in North Africa. The French, Huguen the Huguenots, where were they welcomed? Switzerland, Holland, East Prussia, the current Minister of the Interior, Thomas de Mazière, he is of Huguenot descent. And of course, you all know the Huguenots came to North America. Who do you, where do you think Paul Revere came from? Paul Revere was of Huguenot background. John Jay was Huguenot background. Francis Marion was Huguenot background. A lot of American patriots in our revolution were Huguenot background. Um, de Lafayette was so amazed with the American patriots in the revolution who, who were of Huguenot background that he went back to France and got them to do an edict of toleration to let the French Protestants practice in France again. Any case, this to me is kind of an interesting thing. They were welcomed. Now we're moving very quickly because there's not much time. Mass migrations of refugees at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century were a different story. They were not welcomed by and large, by and large. They came from dissolutions of empires. The Ottoman Empire, the Romanov Empire, the Habsburg Empire, the Hohenzollern Empire. I'm sure you know this, but it's kind of going to just older. We tend to think of these mass migrations in terms of wars. The Russo-Turkish War had half a million refugees, the Balkan Wars, 1912, 1913, 800,000 refugees. World War I had 9 million refugees. That's an interesting way to think about World War I. 9 million refugees. After World War I, there's the League of Nations. That's when we first get the High Commissioner for Refugees, okay, Nansen. And he was given 10 years. This is interesting. They're going to settle the whole problem of refugees in 10 years to negotiate settlement of all these refugees. For example, what are you going to do with all the white Russians? Huh? A lot of them went to France and Germany. Now, this is, again, the Balkan refugees. Again, this is a lot of women, children, old people. Uh, anyhow, I like these pictures. Okay, mass migrations of refugees around World War II. This is mid-20th century. 30 million refugees. Think of World War II in terms of refugees. Most people don't. 30 million, especially the stateless ones. That's where we get DPs, displaced persons. What, what does it mean to be a displaced person? Okay, what does it mean to be a displaced person? It means you have no state. This is Tim's ideas of state. There's no state for these people. Okay, and then to me, a fascinating group that a lot of Americans know very little about are the expulsions of Germans after World War II. This is 1945 to 1947. 12 to 14 million Germans were expelled from the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia, from territories that Poland took over that used to be East Prussia, from northern Yugoslavia from Romania, and where were they expelled? To war-torn Germany, as if Germany could take in 12 to 14 more refugees. This is not a positive experience for these people. These are displaced people. Again, I have women. And it was mostly women, children, and old people. Why? Because the men were kept in labor camps, um, or they were dead, or they were prisoners of war. Some, women, some men came back later. But again, it was mostly women, children, and old people who came through these things. This is of a Berlin camp, and there are a lot of orphans. Now, the case study, because I have to go fast, where we can look more closely at case study of Muslims from the Central Balkans of the 20th century. What I've been amazed at when I study refugees, and these are people who are not, never able to go back to their homes, People go back after wars. Wars are not the main reason people do not return. It's usually something else. Okay. So these are Muslims from the Central Balkans. I mean, what's now Macedonia and Kosovo. Uh, the first Balkan War, the, these were Muslims. Um, the Ottoman army was defeated by the Serbs. The local Muslims are killed. Muslim villages are destroyed. Many Muslims immigrate from here. But there are Muslims left in Kosovo and Macedonia to become a minority. Then there's World War I, Bulgaria occupies, there's famine, and many died, there's World War II. 
will carry occupies again. Uh, there's anti-Turk and anti-Muslim policies. They're put into labor brigades. It's not sweet. But how Muslims survived the interwar period, I have, again, I studied this at length. I have a whole book on this. Um, how they survived. There were three strategies for survival as a minority population. They were members of guilds. So they survived in the marketplace, no matter what the state was like. They survived as members of the Muslim community. They kind of pulled together. And they survived with family connections. How do you survive as a minority community where you're oppressed? But the post-war state terrorism, this is what forced them out from it. State, the state system is what pushed people out. First, it was killing of community leaders and intellectuals in Kosovo. They had anti-Muslim policies. This is after World War II. They survived multiple wars. Uh, again, anti-Muslim policies. When people went into, in the interwar period, when you went into the military, they would have two pots of food. One had pork in it and one didn't. After World War II, it was one pot. So Muslim soldiers had to eat pork when they did their military service. Um, again, all these anti-Muslim practices. But the main thing was what happened in 1947, at least in Skopje, and then also in Sarajevo and later in Brisbane. This is in the Central Balkans. They arrested Turkish community leaders, Muslim leaders, and they had show trials, and they executed four of them with long prison sentences for the rest. So then, thousands of Muslims emigrated to Turkey out of fear. So this is what's known as state terrorism. This is what forced people to migrate. Not the worst, it was the state terrorism. So I, I worked with these people at length. Anyhow, this is the organization. These are the four leaders who were executed. These were the most highly educated people in the community. They had published a Turkish newspaper. They started a Turkish radio station. They organized teacher training programs. These Turkish leaders were not violent in any way. They were executed. Now, just to give you an example of the people, this is because I, I wrote a book on this group. This is uh, the wife of one of the leaders who was executed, Haji Abla. Um, so she um, ended up as, she was a seamstress. She ended up as an actor in the Turkish theater, and she was such a good actor. Her father was also in prison. She got, she ended up going to Turkey, and they all went to Turkey afterwards. Um, this, and I have their birth date. Their year of migration is 57 to Turkey, and then her death date. This is Hidayet Hanım. She migrated to Turkey in 1953. And this is Rafik Özat. He was one of the people who was given a 20-year prison sentence and who wrote about the labor camps <coughs> in Macedonia. They commuted the prison sentences in 1950, but he still served many years of hard labor and ended up migrating to Turkey in 58. So why the state terrorism against the Muslims and Albanians? If you know much about Yugoslavia, there was supposed to be brotherhood in unity. Um, there wasn't in this early period particularly. Um, I think if you understand about nationalism, because there was nationalism behind this idea of brotherhood in unity, I think it relates more to there's an anxiety of incompleteness that nation states carry, and it's often expressed in violence towards minorities, because the minorities remind the majorities of their unwanted memories of the past, and here it's of their Ottoman past. And this continues to this day in most, of, most nationalisms. Um, how does a minority community remember? This is how does this community cope in Turkey with their memories of losing their homes, of losing, because they, they were European, they were European Muslims. People told me, women would tell me how when they dream, they only dream of their homes back in the Balkans. Women would tell me, we remember when we closed our door for the last time. We only dream of that. How do they cope? They cope through ritual. They cope through mevluds. Mevlud is a Muslim ceremony that commemorates the birth of the Prophet. So what this particular community from Skopje finally did is they ended up having mevluds where they brought an annual ritual for the four leaders who had been executed. They have a method for these executed leaders of the And then this is a book that I have on this community. Thank you. Thank you. Well,
thank you um, to the Center for Putting This Together and for inviting me. It's uh, really great to be with you today, and it was a good excuse to leave Washington, D.C. on that uh, day. Um, I just want to take a moment before I start and just recognize that as we're sitting here today, there are about 2,000 Yazidi women and children from the minority a religious group in Iraq who have been the target of a genocidal campaign by ISIS who are still in captivity two and a half years later and who are being subjected to horrific uh, sexual and other violence. Um, I spent most of the last 10 years living and working in Iraq on human rights and trafficking and violence against women and also working with refugee and displaced populations. So what I want to focus on today is looking at experiences of women and girls particularly in terms of why they migrate or need to migrate and some of the challenges that they face both in the process of migration and in accessing legal protections, whether they're still inside their own country or whether they cross an international border. Um, I want to start by just telling you about a young woman named Layla. That's not her real name. But she's uh, an Iraqi Kurdish woman from the northern part of Iraq, and she's a woman in her 30s who came from a very abusive home. Her father and her, her elder brother were very abusive. They used to beat her all the time. Um, she used to take care of her younger siblings, but this was a very strong woman. She was a woman who had a job. She had savings. She had an education. And she also had a boyfriend. Um, and in Iraq, this is something that's very difficult for, for conservative communities where people don't really date. They tend to get married and move from their father's house to their husband's house. So as she um, got older, she and her partner decided that they wanted to get married, and he approached her father and asked uh, for permission to marry according to the traditions of the culture. Um, and her father refused. He said he didn't think that he came from a good family and that he wasn't going to allow her to marry this person. He didn't know that they had a relationship. That would have been a huge problem for her. Um, but then she was stuck. She didn't know how to sort of get around her father's refusal to allow her to marry her partner. Uh, and because she was in her 30s, she was considered pretty old for an Iraqi woman to not be married. So one day she came home, and her father told her that he had, in fact, found a husband for her. Um, this man was a friend of her father's. He was a man who was in his 50s. He had three children, he was a, a widow, and um, Layla refused. She said, I absolutely cannot marry this person. And not only did she refuse because she did not want to marry this person, but she was also afraid that any person that her father would find for her would present a problem because Layla was no longer a virgin. And that was also another issue because she was expected to be a virgin when she married. So she was worried that if she married anyone who her father found, and this was discovered, that her father would kill her uh, for bringing shame to the family. So Layla was in a quandary. She had to figure out what to do and how to protect herself and how to get out of the situation. So she traveled to Turkey, and she went to Turkey where she could request refugee protection from UNHCR and hopefully be resettled to another country. This was a big move for her. Um, she had savings, and she also had a partner who was a successful businessman. So she traveled to Turkey, she went and interviewed with UNHCR, um, and then she had to wait for one year in one of these refugee towns, because in Turkey, and this was before the current crisis, so you would have to go live in a town that was designated for refugees, um, and you had to live on your own sort of savings, and so she spent down her savings, her partner helped contribute. He would visit her, but she was essentially on her own for one year. Um, and then UNHCR came back with their decision, and they denied her refugee protection. Um, and, and they didn't deny her because they said she didn't meet the legal definition of a refugee. They denied her because they said they didn't think that Layla was credible. And when, um, when they said why they didn't think she was credible, they said, well, we didn't think that it was plausible that a woman who was educated and who had a job and who could travel could also face a forced marriage. So I bring up this case because it illustrates a number of issues that women and girls in particular face. Uh, in the context of migration, you see a lot of cases where violence against women and, and gender-based persecution is a motivator and a trigger for women and girls who need to move. And then it's also an issue because it presents heightened risks for them when they do try to travel. Um, and then if you do manage to sort of make that trip and get through all of those barriers, you cross an international border, and now you fall within this international 
uh, refugee protection system, then you encounter all of these issues around um, misconceptions about violence against women, misunderstandings about culture, lack of training in terms of how to adjudicate these claims. Um, and so it's very difficult sometimes to actually access protection that you're entitled to. So discrimination and violence against women is an issue that comes up throughout the entire sort of continuum of migration for many women. And I'm focusing on the Middle East because that's sort of where my background and experience is, but these are issues that come up globally, and so they're not unique to the Middle East by any means. And we're seeing a lot of these issues with migrants coming from Central America, fleeing gang violence, women and girls who are being raped in that process when they're trying to travel through difficult conditions with smugglers. Um, so this is really a problem around the world. So when we look at gender-based um, persecution as a trigger for women and girls leaving, we see a lot of cases of, for example, forced marriage, people who are fleeing forced marriage. And we say that term forced marriage, but I think a lot of us don't really think about what that means. Right? So what does it mean when you have to marry someone who you absolutely don't want to be married to? That means that you're facing a lifetime of sexual violence, a lifetime of domestic violence and abuse, a lifetime of sort of restrictions of living under the control of an individual and his family um, who you don't want to be with. And so, it, you know, this is also another way that we see, another way of sort of understanding that is looking at it from a trafficking paradigm. That someone is being uh, sexually exploited and, and um, placed in a system of domestic servitude. So we see a lot of forced marriage, we see human trafficking, rape and sexual violence, um, honor-based violence, threats of honor killing for people who transgress uh, traditional social norms and, and behaviors. Um, I have worked with uh, a woman who was accused of committing adultery, who then faced an honor killing. And so these are just some of the reasons why women and girls find themselves in situations where they're not safe and then they need to go. And, and so the very nature of gender-based persecution raises a number of barriers for women and girls because, first of all, the violence, violence against women tends to come from the family. The majority of cases come from the people who you live with and who are supposed to protect you. So your first challenge is how do you break out of that home or that environment where you're constantly being monitored and sort of um, restricted and where you're you know, you rely on for all of your sort of needs and support. If you look at sort of a traditional, and I'm sort of generalizing here, but if you look at a traditional system of a person fleeing persecution, political persecution, religious persecution, um, because of your political opinion, you might have, and you do tend to often have the support of your family. I know in Iraq we've seen many cases where people were fleeing from Saddam's regime and the family went out of their way to help get them to safety, selling their homes or you know, finding smuggling networks to get people out of the country so they can be safe. That's not going to happen in a situation where you're facing gender-based gender persecution. If you do manage to sort of move out of that abusive environment, then you face a lot of challenges in terms of the legal context and the state in which you're living. And so you often have laws that are discriminatory. Um, so the, the legal system sort of reinforces and backs up the abuse that the family is perpetrating onto the individual. You might not be able to get travel documents. You might not be able to get your passport. Previously, you had to have the permission of your nearest male relative to get a passport to travel. That is no longer the case, but practically speaking, it can still be very difficult for women and girls to access government offices and get the kind of documentation that they need to then travel. And so if you picture what these countries look like, it's not a situation where you can just get in a car and go and cross a border or go to the airport and fly out. You're often traveling through checkpoints that are manned by uh, government security forces. Sometimes, depending on where you are in the country, they might be manned by uh, different armed groups and militias. There are multiple armed groups operating throughout Iraq and Syria. You don't just have you know, one sort of government entity that is managing security it really depends on where you go and which areas you're moving through. So it's a very sort of difficult situation. So when you go through these checkpoints, you know, you face a lot of questions. Who are you? Where are you going? Where's your family? Who is this that you're with? If a woman is traveling alone in a taxi with a man, that will raise questions about why is she alone? Where is she going? Who is this person? And she could, and we've seen cases where women or couples who are even fleeing forced marriage um, have been detained either for their protection or 
for criminal um, charges because it's illegal to, to have relationships outside of the context of marriage or return home. So you're sort of dealing with, you know, how do you break out of the, the abusive situation at home? How do you break out of the sort of very difficult, restrictive, um, oppressive environment in the country and also very insecure? I mean, there's a war going on. So in much of the country, it is unstable and it's not safe for people to travel easily. And then, if you do manage to cross an international border, now like Layla, you're facing a very sort of difficult system where um, you now need to present your case in order to get protection. And if we look at the 1951 Geneva Convention, a refugee is defined as someone who has fled their country of origin, who is unable or unwilling to return because they have a fear, a well-founded fear of persecution on account of one of five grounds. So that includes religion, uh, race, nationality, membership in a particular social group, and political opinion. It doesn't include gender. So where do these cases fall? What happens is, and according to UNHCR guidelines, they can fall within any of these five groups. But you need someone who's able to sort of understand and elicit that information in order to be able to find how that person qualifies. Oftentimes, these cases fall within political opinion uh, category because maybe that person doesn't agree with the, the, the lack of women's rights or the sort of restrictive ways in which a person is supposed to live in her society. But I would say the vast majority, and this is in the refugee system as well as in the U.S. asylum system, so if they manage to get to the U.S., and they sometimes do, um, they can apply for asylum protection. But many of these cases fall within a particular social group. In the U.S., this is not in any way settled law. There are a lot of challenges that women face in presenting these kinds of claims, and it has taken many years for us to even get to the point. Um, the first case that was recognized by the Board of Immigration Appeals that recognized um, forced marriage and FGM as a grounds of persecution was in 1997. Um, and so, you know, UNHCR has guidelines on how to adjudicate these cases. Sometimes you're traveling with relatives. You might be in an interview with a UN, UN officer, and maybe there is something that's going on with the family that the person who's being abused cannot disclose. Maybe there's trafficking, maybe there's forced marriage, maybe there's severe domestic violence. But if the UN officer is interviewing you as a family unit, they tend to focus on the male head of household. And so they really need to be trained and attuned how to flag potential issues and how to separate parties that they need to and interview someone privately and confidentially so that they are able to safely disclose what's going on. Um, so I just that's kind of just a snapshot in terms of what we're seeing in the, along the continuum. Um, when women and girls travel, they're also at really high risk of being exploited and abused in traffic. So that's in the migration process in their own country and then in um, the country of refuge. So in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, and all of these countries where there are you know, hundreds of thousands of refugees, people are living in very unsafe conditions. People don't always think about this, but the way you construct a camp, for example, can reduce and present, prevent violence against women if it's properly lit, if the toilets are placed in certain ways, if there are staff and services that are in place to help people and provide safe places for people to come for services, that doesn't always happen. And I've seen this in Iraq over and over again. Everyone knows what they're supposed to do, but then no one is prepared to actually set things up in a way that tries to prevent further abuses. They always just throw these camps together, everyone comes in, the violence starts, and then everyone's scrambling to deal with it later. And so I think there's a lot that we can do in terms of strengthening these systems, both for people who are displaced within their own country and for people who are displaced across borders um, through better training, through making sure that we're, we're actually applying the standards that we have. If these standards were applied, I think they would go a long way towards preventing further abuse. And then the last sort of thing I just want to mention is conflict as a trigger and a driver for um, for people in the Middle East and, and the unique implications for women and girls. So I mentioned the Yazidi population, which you may have heard of, which is a, a small uh, religious minority group that has lived um, in the Sinjar area of Nineveh. And ISIS attacked um, Sinjar in 2014 and basically flushed out more than 200,000 people, abducted 
an estimated 5,000 women and girls and enslaved them and subjected them to horrific sexual violence and abuse. But they're not the only ones, right? And so women and girls from every ethnic and religious background in Iraq have faced um, sexual violence, have been forced into marriages, in displacement, they're being married off young because their families can't take care of them. And um, I think we really need to think about, one, of course, prevention, but then how do we sort of address these issues when people manage to get out of those situations. And from what I've seen, because I've worked with the ACD population, I've worked with other um, communities that have been displaced in Iraq, we're really not, if you saw the conditions that these people were living in, you would be horrified. Um, people who have gone through atrocities that you really cannot even imagine, then come and are living in tents, with very few services, practically no um, psychosocial support or mental health services, and they're just deeply traumatized and have no, and you know, one of the other issues that we're facing, of course, is just all of this conflict and political gridlock. No one is really finding sustainable solutions to make it safe for populations to return home. And so everyone is living in limbo for just prolonged periods of time. So it makes it very hard for communities to um, recover and just start to rebuild. So that's just a snapshot of sort of how gender comes up in migration issues in the refugee um, process. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I might watch that, I'll take about 21 minutes. Um, but uh, somebody's going to have to keep track of time because I don't have a watch or a phone on me. But uh, thank you all very much. That was uh, absolutely intriguing. And, and as moderator, I get the benefit of asking the first question and then we'll go to the jury. But I'm curious, if you will, thinking about your specialization, your expertise, how, how do you see that, how do you see it coupled together with? Migrations that are or will occur as a result of seeking a sustainable environment to, to, to be in, and I'm, I'm basing this off the assumption of, of you know, climate change pushing people to the fringes. And so I'm curious, what do you see? How do you see your specific area as it relates to the, mi the mass migrations that will occur? You're talking about forced, forced migrants, if you will. The refugees. Yes. Um. These are people who have no choice. Yes. Absolutely no choice. Mm -hmm. And so climate has nothing to do with it. These people just don't have choice. Well, I'm, I'm not talking about there being the, the migration that will occur because of climate change. Because people are, will be forced to leave. Because land will, will not be tillable any longer. And, and, I, and I can see potentially each of your areas speaking to these groups that are going to move from, say, I mean, you can even say from, from the southwest of the United States to um, oh, the Oh, you're yeah, talking about all of us. Yes, collect, I'm sorry, I yeah, was yeah. looking at you, but I was collectively you know, thinking about states, thinking about gender. How do you see your, your expertise like, sort of informing where we, where we go, decisions we make, policies we implement in relation to the mass migrations that are supposed to occur? Uh, I'll, I'll say first, I guess, um, if I understand what you're asking, I, I think the, the, the most plausible framework is, is uh, continuing the theme of this as um, a useful obstacle, right? So uh, clearly, right, as a, like a legal and doctrinal matter, I think it's totally uncontroversial. These people would be what we would now call uh, economic migrants. I right? call them climate migrants, but what you can't call them is the kind of migrants who are going to have a, an obvious legal claim. It would require a dramatic shift in the way we talk about what claims you can make to have some purchase in the system. The way of looking at it is that states are in an excellent position to say, I am not going to respond to that, or I'll respond opportunistically. Maybe I want migrants, uh, so I'll let people in, but the legal structure doesn't have any place for this, and I think predictably isn't going to create one anytime soon. Uh, I would note as well, uh, you know, uh, I think right now the, the new Al Gore movie is coming out like today. Um, the last one had this dramatic footage of you know, the melting ice caps and stuff and the sea levels rising. Of course, it's not going to be as fast as that. This is going to be a slow process. And that means the response is going to be slow enough, I think, that people will move in, uh, they're not going to be moving in panicked millions in the way we see like across the Mediterranean today, which means that the response will be much less uh, crisis-driven uh, than 
we might think now. That's not necessarily a good thing, because the problem will still be there, but the problem will be dragged out just enough for nobody, no state to have to, have to deal with it as a crisis, as a threat, which means we could expect the legal framework will just push it now. I don't imagine there's going to be a new category of climate migrant recognized in a new, uh, new set of conventions. Thanks. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Um, I'm, but this is me for me. So. Um, yeah, certainly. If you're talking about the United States, is that your main interest? Well, the United States, you can look at um, the Russia, Northern Europe, you can look at... I mean, certain places are going to be hurt more than others. Mm -hmm. And um, I think places that... What fascinated me is that the Russian Federation was and what they've done with uh, the way they have their agriculture and greenhouses. I mean, there's there's certain ways that you can deal with coastal change. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking coastal change. And the way the Netherlands has just amazing agriculture and greenhouses. There, there's going to be technological ways of coping, but people who actually live in coastal regions are going to have to change. And it is going to be, it, it will be step by step. Um, so I, but there's going to be places like Florida that are going to be hurt more than Kansas. Yeah, I mean, yesterday was a headline that I think by 2050, 36% of people in the U.S. will not be able to afford water. I mean, that's just, you know, you said you know, about the U.S., and so obviously it's, it's going to affect people across the board. None of us dealt with that. This is your interest. Well, I was thinking about the idea of sustainability, which is the symposium, and I'm trying to relate what you're talking about to sustainability. Yeah. So that's all. Yeah. Uh, I think one thing to keep in mind is that, and this has sort of been a trend in the last 10 years, is that we really need to look at migration in terms of mixed migration. So we tend to want to look at people in terms of this singular primary motivator for why they move, and then that informs all kinds of you know, legal responses in terms of permission to enter a certain place or qualify for some sort of benefit. But people often have mixed motives for moving. And so I think we need to really sort of shift the paradigm and shift the way that we're thinking about um, migration, what motivates it, and, and you know, how do we want to respond so that people aren't stuck in these sort of indefinite, um, you know, that they're not stuck, sort of unable to work, unable to send their kids to school for prolonged periods of time because the reality is that once large populations are displaced, like what we're seeing now, they don't, the situation doesn't improve, you know, quickly so they can go back home. And so we're not being realistic, I think, about what the reality is. And I think that our current refugee um, approach and, and also just the different ways that people enter the United States or Europe through work visas, student visas, all of that, I mean, I think we really need to sort of rethink how that's working and are there sort of broader ways to look at this. And one thing I just want to add, because I was talking about gender, is that for victims of gender-based persecution, as I mentioned, they face many barriers to movement. So one of my suggestions would be that we really need to be able to reach into the country to extend protection to victims who don't then need to be forced to move out, because to move puts them at risk of either being killed or exploited or trafficked. And so I've worked on some of these cases where you can, um, and they're difficult. And a lot of cases, you know, we all, anyone who works on this issue, a lot of cases get referred to you where someone is stuck in a detention center indefinitely. I've got two cases in a shelter in Suleimania who have been living there for five years for trying to get them out of the country. If they were across an international border, 100% they qualify for refugee protection and would probably be resettled. But because they can't do that, they're just stuck, and you know, you're in your 20s, you can't spend the rest of your life living like this. So can we start to rethink you know, the initial conceptions we had around what makes a refugee, who qualifies for, for protection, and can we just change the rules so that we're actually addressing the reality of what's happening? Questions? Yes, um, I'm sorry to try and jump in first, and I should get to class soon, but my question uh, is from Ms. Minwala. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Ms. Minwala. Um, uh, well, thank you uh, to all for being here, but uh, while I have time, I'd like to ask you in particular um, kind of a two-parter. So generally, um, what is the impact um, of having a large uh, gender imbalance, whether it's, you know, disproportionate number of women, say, in Central Asia, or disproportionate number of men in China, the examples that spring to my mind, and how does that shape or reshape? Um, the uh, problems of forced marriage, gender violence over the long run, whether it's in a forced marriage or in a nominally agreed to marriage that 
that you know doesn't live up to what we would expect in Western society of how uh, a woman or wife should be treated. Um, and uh, what does that impact say on family planning as well? And uh, you know, bringing it back to the problems of uh, gender violence and where they go if they become refugees. Because um, I imagine family planning is much harder for a family of refugees say, if the right. husband does come. Right. Well, and I think you know, and um, I think one of the issues, of course, is that men are often killed in yeah. war, right, and women become widows or. Uh, they don't know what happened to their husbands, and so they're just kind of in limbo. Mm -hmm. When you're living in an environment where women are expected to rely on men for protection and livelihood support, mm -hmm. that creates all kinds of vulnerabilities to being exploited and abused. So sometimes what we see is that women are then, you know, if they're widows and their husbands are confirmed dead, they're then being forced to marry someone because they shouldn't really be on their own. It's not considered mm -hmm. acceptable. Or you know, many of them are living on their own and taking care of their children, but it's very difficult for them to, um, to sometimes even access humanitarian aid, for example. Um, these systems don't really work the way that I think they should, and so women who might not be able to travel, you know, to the other side of the camp easily to get the distribution that's being made, you know, like her family um, would be negatively impacted. And I think you just, you see, and you even mentioned this earlier, that a lot of the migrants and a lot of the people who are forced to be displaced are women. And if the risks to you of, um, you know, if you have male relatives who can help protect you, you're much more, you're, you're much less likely to face abuse in that process. So I think there's just a heightened risk of abuse when there's an imbalance of women in that way. Right. I mean, there, I think there are some interesting sort of um, studies done on places like China and India where you have imbalance in the other direction where girls have been killed um, as part of uh, population planning and restrictive policies like the one-child policy or forced sterilization in India. Um, where now you have like this small, much smaller population of women and I, I haven't really sort of focused so much on that issue but I, I do think it does create other problems and I, I, I don't know if I can really sort of speak so much to that. Um, but I think in terms of family planning, I mean, this is a big issue. Do women have control over decisions about, about reproduction, around um, do, they, do they have access to birth control? Um, when you're displaced, I mean, these things are not necessarily available, and so people are still continuing to have families, even living in really difficult conditions. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but... I've got ideas for more research now. Okay. Oh, uh, but more specific on your area of expertise. So about... Uh, 5,000 uh, 5, uh, Yazidi women had uh, been abducted and currently there's still about 2,000. Mm -hmm. um, of the, I guess, 3,000 gap, what have been their experiences trying to reintegrate, get mm -hmm. home? So I would imagine, tragically, at least a fraction of them must have been flat out killed in one way or another. But what about those surviving and uh, what, have, what challenges have they faced? Yeah, that I can speak to. I mean, so what's been really remarkable, the Yazidi community has been attacked many times in the past under the Ottoman Empire. Um, and in the past, when the women were abducted, they were considered gone. They were not accepted back into the community. They were considered to have converted to Islam, or if they were raped, their honor was gone, and so they could not reintegrate. This time, things were entirely different, and the um, spiritual leader of the Yazidi community had consulted with other religious leaders and they agreed to accept the women back with honor, which was a remarkable sort of step forward and gave permission to families to take women and girls back. And so not only have they accepted them back, they have gone to great lengths to rescue them and, and, and borrow you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy back their women and girls and then take them back into their families. Does that mean that there are no problems? Not at all. There is stigma, um, there are issues around honor, but there is room to do something different, and probably, uh, I think as many as 2,000 were taken through a program to Germany where they were able to access psychological services, go to school, and try to sort of restart their lives. There are some issues with that program, but I think in many ways... I've seen them in Germany, and it's interesting what they've done with the Yazidis in Germany, especially the women because at least the groups that I've seen in Germany, it's almost all women and children, no men. Right. And I, I don't know if the men are dead, but they just didn't make it to you. Not all of them. Okay. So that's kind of a problem. It's been one of the criticisms of the program because they're not uh, relocating them with their families. 
and that's a problem. So I saw Yazidi yeah. women and children in Germany, I just came back from Germany, in Germany, and it's interesting, where are they going to locate them? Because they don't want to locate them with other migrants. There's the question of the Muslims and the Yazidis mm -hmm. being together. So in one of the German towns I was in, they put them in a convent. And I thought that was an interesting mm -hmm. response. Yeah. And then there are those who are still in the Kurdish area living in camps. Um, just really difficult conditions. I mean, these are people who have suffered extreme trauma. They have flashbacks. They're actually, objectively speaking, they're safe. But in their mind, they're not, right? And so they feel like at any time ISIS can come and abduct them again. And they have relatives in captivity. So the whole community actually is quite traumatized because everybody's got someone who's still held with ISIS, whether it's their kids, their siblings, their parents, or, you know, uh, the relatives have been killed. So um, it's sort of a mixed bag, and some of the Yazidi families, including the survivors, have tried to go to Europe. Some of them have made it, some of them are stuck in Greece, some of them have been drowned in the Mediterranean, so... It's a genocide. It's a genocide. It's a yeah. genocide. Yeah. At least that's, the people have honestly been saying, that, well, that was the attempt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or I, I don't have to imagine. Thank you so much. I have to be much more wrong. Next question. Um, so I'm, I'm quite interested in the juxtaposition of Waters and Nimwala here. Because Nimwala gives us the individual story and the individuals perhaps choice, decision, meaning, belief that they can solve their problems by moving out of the country and the barriers to that and so forth. Waters gives us the systemic theory, which is might suggest that you can tweak some things, but wouldn't tweaks encourage precisely the solution that you're looking at, which is, now I know that there is a refugee option for me, I will take it, um, therefore increasing the likelihood that uh, rather than looking for other solutions within country to, say, solve the problems of domestic violence, the the intelligent person who knows about refugee status seeks that option as preferable. Um, this would then not put pressure on countries to fix their own problems. So does tweaking laws in a way that facilitates the good of individuals inherently take away the possibilities that an international system can pressure countries to try to revise their own internal policies so that, for example, domestic abuse gets addressed in a decent way instead of just creating some escape hatch. So I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about your, your what can be tweaked, but I also want to hear about the, the consequences of tweaks to migration systems. It's a great question. Um, it's true that the tweaks, of course, are a way of changing people's incentives, not simply preventing them re channeling. Uh, I actually wrote an op ed recently, very much on this theme, uh, thinking about the sort of tragic problem and, and lack of good solutions to the, to the Mediterranean migration crisis. Uh, I was prompted by this, it actually gave us a reading to my students last week. Our first reading was the rather uh, informatively titled uh, New York Times article, Stepping Over Dead Bodies on a Migrant Boat. Um, that sure got discussion very quickly in class. Um, but the what, what prompted me to, to give that assignment and to write about it is uh, this you know, quite well known article with truly shocking photographs of dead people on boats. Um, but what but, but most interested me in it as something to think about was where it happened. The article pointed out it was 12 miles off the coast of Libya. Anyone who knows anything about law knows that 12 miles is not a trivial thing, there's a reason why it's there, um, having to do with territory and so forth. But also, what, what intrigued me was that the photographs in that accompany this article looked like they were out in the high seas, right? There was nothing in sight. Of course, they're right off the coast. And there's a whole, like, economy of the migration here, which over time has shifted the rescue efforts to the Libyan coast, which is sensible and humanitarian. Why wait until they're, so this is 400 miles to Italy, right? 200 miles of the nearest landfall on a tiny island, if you can find it. So people will die in the middle of nowhere, um, and what's happened is the, the rescue effort has moved to the coast, very sensibly. But in effect, this has produced a rather ironic transit route, which is being funded and, and actually completed by NGOs and the Italian Navy. 
right? So, and you can see this in the economics of the migrants, of the smugglers, who now put less seaworthy boats with no fuel and no food on board. Why cut your profit margins, right? Because all you got to do is get about, you know, 12 miles offshore, start to sink, and pray for rescue. That's the actual transit route. Um, so I think, you know, that the, so what do you do in this situation? You don't let people drown, but the act of saving them is actually producing a more effective pipeline for transit, right? So then we can discuss what one does in response. You return people to shore. Um, but what I, I think to short circuit the, 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 the discussion, the problems, the tragedy, I think, is the intuition that you're suggesting, which we all would have, is that if we were to shut this pipeline in some way, um, it would force change in the sending country or force the receiving countries to do something about it. Of course, the, the problem is that that's probably not true, right? So there's, there is no equation of pressure. I remember, when I think of this, uh, when I first encountered this subject when I was in law school, I took asylum and refugee law, which is a truly fascinating class, whose fundamental ideological argument I disagreed with. The, the professor who was brilliant and fascinating suggested that the refugee crisis at that time, which is smaller than the one today, um, uh, was a kind of not only moral but, but systemic challenge to the, to the state model. And not that this was just fundamentally wrong. This was, this was desire overriding analysis. Because it's just not true that the states we have are challenged by the existence of 60 million or so stateless people wandering the earth. It's a moral tragedy, but it doesn't actually shake the foundations of you know, Poland or the United States or Bolivia as units. These are just people who fall in between the cracks of the system, and there they stay in the permanent camps. So I think it's a, a tragedy without a solution. The tweets are really about, um, do you want to save drowning people, and can you do it in a way that doesn't actually make more people step into the water? I think the current policy actually does that. I propose in this op-ed a rather harsh and draconian model of return for the sake of stopping them getting into the water in the first place. But in no way would this actually solve the problem. It just pushes it back, and it's an entirely separate question whether we're going to do something about the sending conditions, which are the real driver of the movement in the first place. I think there is no solution because we don't have, uh, for the reasons I said earlier. But, but, but right now, what we have to look at is the political situation in Europe. Europe has about 500 million people. <coughs> people forget that the numbers really matter here. Um, or, or, I mean, if you think about 500 million people, but no, nobody thinks that. But we have to think about are the um, elections in Europe that are coming up, the ones in France and then especially the ones in Germany. And if we don't think about that, those really matter. And the more that um, refugees get sent in, the, the more, especially the German election, America is in trouble. And um, the, the more refugees come in, you know, what's going to happen to her? Um, and uh, Americans in general don't follow those elections as much as we should. That's why we can't forget about the person who's being um, inaugurated today in his ridiculous um, interview with Duskfield. Um, so, so, I mean, this, this migration issue is huge, absolutely huge in Europe. Do people know what I'm referring to here? I mean, th this is this is the scary part. Um, if you think about 500 million people in Europe, should, Europe should be able to take some of these migrants, but they're not sharing them. And um, it, it, it's Germany took almost a million, and it, and places like Poland and the Czech Republic and um, Slovakia and Hungary. I disagree with you on Hungary. Um, are just absolutely saying we can't take anybody, anybody, and we, I still remember the 56 taking refugees from Hungary, um, old enough. Um, so the fact that they don't take any, um, I think this is just a totally reprehensible, but then I look at my own government and we're being so awful. Francis, the point is, and I know we disagree on that, it's fine, we disagree on almost everything, it's okay. Yeah. But <laughs> what I assume we don't disagree on is it may be reprehensible, but it is, it is eminently possible to adopt such a model, nothing in the legal political structure uh, requires or even incentivizes any other response. You may not like it, you may call on moral grounds for it to be otherwise. All I'm saying is, and you might actually agree on this, there is no reason to think it need be otherwise, other than the moral grounds. And, and the rest of it is what's going to drive decisions. 
The Hungarians don't agree with you that it's reprehensible. Not to and take they don't any, have to change it. Not to take any. Yeah, that's their policy already is zero. Zero. And, and uh, that's zero wonderful. is a completely mm -hmm. possible Why are they solution? taking all this money from the EU? Well, I think part of the question was directed back to Manuel. Do you want to respond? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think you raise a really important yeah. point, which is that we, we do need to work on improving the situation internally in these countries with regard to human rights, violence against women, strengthening legal protections. And in fact, you know, things have deteriorated significantly since ISIS um, took Mosul. But there has been a lot of work in Iraq by activists and NGOs on trying to advance women's rights and protection. And I would say in many cases, these cases are solved locally through negotiation or through going to the courts. Um, it's not always, I think, the best outcome, but there are solutions. And I think we need to make sure that we always have these protections for those cases for which there is no resolution, and they will always be there. Um, the, the issue that I talked about in terms of trying to reach inside to a country, um, when I think about the countries that have sort of the highest levels of violence, the least protections, maybe weak states that are really unable or unwilling to uh, deal with issues of violence against women, I think you could really just prioritize some of those countries, and you can set a quota. I think people get worried that violence against women is so widespread that you would open the floodgates, but there are really ways to manage it. And most people generally just don't find a way to sort of get out, um, even if they know that the options are there. And, and I think most people generally don't want to. If they can find a solution in their own country, it's really hard to move. So I think most of them would prefer to stay in their communities and their families and find a way to live peacefully. So if they can be supported, I think that you know you have to sort of look at these in tandem and be working on strengthening the situation in the country while always making sure that the protection system is a strong one. Questions? So, uh, it's mainly for the Shirazan. So you talk about improving the situation in the countries, but how? Um, you mean political interventions, humanitarian work, um, how, can this be done? how can this be done? So on many different levels. I mean, part of it, so you have massive di displacement in the country. So one way that you need to improve uh, protection is for displaced populations in the camps, who don't necessarily have access to courts, to, um, you know, their regular sort of communities and structures that they would have relied on before. I mean, in the Middle East, people rely a lot on their sort of networks and their, their families and their extended families to help protect them when there's a problem. But when you're displaced, all of that goes away. So finding ways to kind of replace that. But also, you know, there are good laws, for example, in Iraq. There are laws that, um, that uh, make forced marriage illegal, for example. There's an anti-trafficking law that's been passed by Iraq. So there are laws that exist um, that are just under-enforced in many ways, and so like, there needs to be more effort in terms of implementation. There are also laws that condone violence against women. You can get a reduced sentence if you kill under the pretext of honor. So those need to be addressed, and that has been addressed in the Kurdish region. So you have a separate legal um, structure in the north and they have made a lot of progress in terms of prosecuting people who kill for honor so you, you see that change can happen and there needs to be that political will in that space to do that and then i think one of the really key issues is safe space for women so in the north there are three shelters run by the government they're awful it's like being in the jail you, you can't really go inside you're stuck inside but they do save lives and people are in the shelters while NGOs and the staff are trying to find a solution in their case. So you need to have safe spaces for people to go when a crisis emerges and, um, and they need immediate protection. And that doesn't really exist in the rest of Iraq. Although in the rest of Iraq, I would say people sometimes go to powerful tribal leaders or religious leaders for protection or another powerful family member who can protect them. So there are options, but I think those need to be improved so that People can calm down, people can negotiate and try to find a solution, um, but you can't do that when the person is in, in, in an unsafe situation. So I think you need to look at it from a legal perspective as well as a social um, and security perspective. Dr. Buckley, do you have a question? Uh, um, this is actually a family who has been previous to insightful comments, and we just um, 
but Francis well, doesn't even think on this would be great, but I think it, it refers to this idea about incentives and thinking about um, the case laws of our genre, particularly in terms of gender based violence. Um, is there a potential leverage for using um, the politics of shame to give tweaks in the legal um, area to address things like? Um, gender-based violence and decreasing that. In the Rosario case a few years ago, when a woman um, was being interviewed for asylum because of gender-based violence, it was seen as just this incredibly shameful um, situation because, oh, it's actually gender, this is, this is something political. It, it, it prompted a fairly authoritarian and not really gender-friendly regime to pass some laws to open some shelters to move quickly because it was just too embarrassing as an aspirational member of um, you know, the Democratic um, world. Kind of is that a possibility? Because again, it's a different sort of incentive, not the incentives from the migrants. But um, who knows? Maybe I can today when I'm pushing that. I don't know. But I'd love to hear your insights. I, I, as, I was, as you're writing, I wrote down my note and I wrote the word yes with, a, with an exclamation point in, the, in a desperate attempt to be optimistic. Um, but as, as, as certain people in the room know, that is just not how my brain works. Um, uh, so yes, uh, I'll say it, yes. Um, but, uh, so, but the two things. Yeah, it, it, is, it is indeed a, a tool, if I remember this case, it's partly to do with the timing of what was Eurovision, right? Was, so, so there are moments the like, contest. yeah, right, yeah. so that both suggests how shame, uh, the politics of shame works as a tool, and of course it's, it's opportunistic limits, right? Because uh, who's talking about it now, right? So yes, you can do something with it, um, but, but as we know, not a lot, it's, it's, a, it's a wasting uh, uh, asset in a sense, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, work for long. There's lots of evidence that states can just sort of buckle down and ride through it. Um, the other thing I'd say, this is the, the, the more, um, let's call it realistic part of the response to the politics of shaming is the reason, so I also work in human rights, the reason that shaming is such a, a, a prominent tool is the absence of anything else. Um, so... Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Um, I think that what Tim said with your, the points that you made, um, in the sense that, and I've seen that. So, for example, in the Kurdistan region, um, kind of strange because it was 2007 when I first moved there, and a young Yazidi girl was killed. She was 21. She was killed for having a relationship with a Muslim. It was a horrific honor killing. They stoned her to death, and the media attention was global. You know, CNN was here and everything. I think that really prompted the government. The government was just horrified. At, you know, they looked completely barbaric, and that really prompted them to open directorates for dealing with violence against women. There are issues with how they do their work. It's oftentimes very sort of traditional and focused, but but they're doing something. And there are directorates throughout the Kurdistan region. They have open shelters. They have police who deal specifically with these issues. Um, and so I think that can bring about change. I think the media can play an important role. It can also play a negative role. Um, I think the media played a really negative role with dealing with reporting on BCD survivors. Um, but they can play an important role in drawing attention and pressuring governments to do something. We've seen the same thing in Pakistan with some of those honor killings. But again, I don't know what the tone is going to be now. You know, who is really going to stand up for these values and say that they still matter? Um, if we don't get that from our leadership, then how do we go out into the world and say that these things matter? If, you know, people are already saying, well, who are you, you know, to bring these things up? So, but I do think that there's always ways to kind of create that, that pressure. I think, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I would go, not even so much the shame, but I was always interested in the Western side of gender issues. I worked in uh, refugee transit camps. In, uh, along the Balkan uh, migrant trail. This is when it was still open. And what you're saying about um, problems for women from, uh, 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 being migrants was incredibly true. Uh, people couldn't go to the toilets because they were afraid of being assaulted. And whoever designed the camps didn't think of those things. 
and so you would have two big tents, and I kept saying, why don't we have one tent for families and one tent for the single men? Because in that case, there were tons of single men. Again, the single men were trying to get, not have to serve in Assad's armies or in the ISIS armies, so you know, you had a preponderance of single men, but you did have families, you did have women and children. But they juggled everybody together, and so the women were very nervous. I, we had women not eating and not going to the bathroom because they didn't feel confident in the facilities. But I was always looking at how the aid organizations were working. And so one of the camps I worked in, they had no female medical people. It was all male. And we had a woman die because she was expecting and she wouldn't go to any of the male um, medical people. I mean, this is just stupid. And they had a UNICEF person. People know what I think of the UN. Uh, but this was really, again, UNICEF. It's, it's young women and children. So they, they, the first person they had was a man from Saudi Arabia, and the next person they had was this old guy from Denmark. I mean, this is somebody where you, a position you want a woman in. I, I don't care what country they come from. But, you know, they had these, these old men getting big salaries um, in positions where they should have had women. So constantly it was male organizations. The Red Cross only had males. Um, and the women, what we learned, the, the, the countries that had the greatest uh, amount of female assault were Greece, Croatia, and Austria. I, I mean, this, is, this, is, this was known along the trail. So, I, I mean, you could have designed those camps so they would have been safe, and nobody did it. And you had women going along there. Well, I believe we're out of time for this panel, and um, I know some of you, we have two minutes. Okay, one more quick question. I think she had a question first. Oh, it's her sort of comment, just in terms of deterrence and politics of that. I come from a country that elections are won and lost in immigration, basically, in my country. A couple of thousand refugees create the conditions for parties winning and losing, and I just wondered if you guys would comment on whether you think deterrence works, because in terms of looking at it from a legal framework, it's different from looking at it from the migrants framework. Because for the people who are getting on boats in Indonesia and Malaysia, they either get sent back to their country, where they have fled because they're at risk of death or persecution. In Indonesia, they get jailed randomly, uh, have to pay bribes. They're not legally allowed to work, so they have no livelihoods. So stepping on a boat, even if you do die, doesn't actually seem like that bad of a choice. I've worked with people who've done that. And my government has decided in the name of protection to detain people indefinitely. We are one of the only countries, according to the Human Rights Watch, that has, well, the only country that has a mandatory detention of indefinitely putting children, women, pregnant people, men, into detainment. So I just wonder, at what point do we recognize the politics of deterrence? What's your perspective on, on that? What are the options for migrants? Should we be deterring people? Sorry. <laughs> That's a two minute question. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's, a, please, it's, it's a really about. important question. It's a really good question. Does anybody I want mean, to say I would just say that clearly people are moving because they feel they have no other choice. Like you yeah. said, if they're willing to get on a boat knowing that they might not make it, um, they don't really feel like there's another option. And I think we need to, you know, we need to look at the stories behind the numbers. Each person has a story of trauma, of persecution that they're fleeing. There's a reason why they can't go back, and I think we need to have much more empathy in terms of how we're treating these refugees to recognize that, you know, you don't do that because you just want to go find a job. Um, you're doing it because you're trying to save your life and your family. Um, and I'm not saying that there are not other people who are mixed in. Again, mixed migration is an issue. But, um, yeah, but even then, like, economic migrants, you know, are, are voted by economic migrants as well. And I mean, it's the same thing we are talking about before. The context is, if I go home, my family are going to die anyway because we can't afford to live. Right. So it's like, it's at what point, yeah. there's a real politics of survival and there's mm -hmm. a politics of what kind of life we expect people to leave. Lead. So it's like, okay, so you can, these people can live in Indonesia. It's like, well, yeah, they can live through survival sex, I guess. That seems like a good option. I mean, at what point do we recognize that some lives are not actually livable? Right. So even if they are just economic migrants or whatever, it's a, and this comes back to the category problem about who is a refugee, uh, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I, I think I agree with what we're talking about at the start of the discussion here about how we understand those categories is really significant to the kind of conversations we have about migration. I just sort of flag that because, I mean, obviously the Mediterranean is a much bigger problem, but there's also, like, in terms of numbers, but there's a, symboliz there's a symbolism about how we understand migration policy to work. If, if by deterrence you mean de incentivizing migration. Yeah, or de incentivizing people stepping on boats. Yeah, perhaps, right. Then I think. Uh, from Australia, right? Yeah. Uh, that, from what I know of that case, this is a this is a pretty strong proof that, that deterrence um, works because the you're describing the costs of a deterrence program to human beings, but landfalls in Australia have dropped to much lower numbers precisely because of these brutal, unyielding seaborne deterrence policies that say we don't recognize you, we detain you, we send you to Nauru. To live in these ridiculous, uh, you know, wastelands. Sure. In fact, so, I mean, the, the numbers are the numbers are debatable because well, my country actually a has a block on the numbers at the moment. So, <laughs> the good point. So, so it's an empirical sense. question, in other words. But but if it's not deterring people, and because you're right, the reasons for leaving are not affected by the difficulty of getting there. But it's a if it's true that the numbers have fallen off, then there's the answer to your question, right? And it's certainly true in other places like Spain that uh, that seaborne deterrence has in fact. Lowered the numbers. Uh, to mind my numbers, if that's true, and I think it is, it's a contestable question, but there are many places where they're not going to They're trying to get to New Zealand now. Well, so but yes, they're they're all people the people birds in the Mediterranean. But what it shows is, I mean, you're describing the brutality of the system, but this system is brutal and it is unresponsive, and to go back to your original framework, I think it's sustainable. Well, I think this is fodder for a great discussion. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I guess we do need to take, step in and take a break. Um, but please talk with the panelists and give them a round of applause. Thank you.